Mirita, sa të filluem pra me ditën e dytë, shpresoj që përme qenë interesant. Prezentu si i por, është Daniel Cosentino, ligjerata përme qenë në gjurë në anglizë, dhe të mundë të bëjë një prezentë e më në gjurë shqipe. Danieli është profesor në Universitetin Amerikanë në Kosovë, po gjithashtu mirët të të pak me planifikim. Ka po të so projekte, në prej të në ka qenë planifikimi i bazumë në komunitet, në lojën e do dunës, po ma shumë letë vetë të kë. Ju të shrej, shkim të këtë shumë. Ndi gjithë. Hi, friends. Thank you so much. I'm going to go, I have a half an hour here, so I'm going to go kind of quickly. Um, this is the Community Design Pristina. It's an event that we did this year. Uh, there was a symposium, an exhibition, and um, a, a charrette, a mini charrette exercise we did in the Dodona neighborhood. And I'm going to take you between Pristina and Rochester, New York and through some of my personal work uh, and, and show you what we're trying to accomplish in Pristina. I'm a faculty member at the American University in Kosovo uh, and I've been here five years, so we can ask questions after. If anybody has a question about any of this work, interrupt me and I can answer it. Um, this has some sound, but don't worry about it. I wanted to thank our crew um, who did this, because uh, they often don't get thanked. Uh, Adelina Vyotza, Gentian Valdete, Volkan Rita, Michael, who's here uh, in the front row, Alicia, another colleague, uh, lots of staff and people that came together. In the end, um, we worked for about three months to kind of build this model here in Pristina. Uh, and the U.S. Embassy may or may not like what we say about it. <laughs> so this is that. So here we go, Rochester, New York. Uh, before I moved here, I lived in this city. There's an aerial view up of, of it. Um, let's see if I have this pointer. Actually, I don't have it there, where did it go? Up there is one of the great lakes that borders Canada, a big, large, freshwater source. Um, here we are in the States. There's the New York area. Just to give you a, a, a size of scale, um, these are community design centers. This is as of a few years ago in the United States. I think the red ones indicate those kind of centers that are associated with um, uh, universities, and the blue ones are independent design centers. And they're, um, we'll get to what those are in a minute. Um, so here's New York. Uh, here's the, the area, or the nine county area in which Rochester serves. And if we look at it in terms of size and population, it's about the same size as Kosovo and same population of Kosovo. Very different demographics, very different space. But we're, we're serving and thinking about the same uh, population numbers anyway, and same land area. Here we are from above. Uh, Rochester is founded in 1803. There's a population. I won't get much into this. We'll go, go further. Our demographic is quite different. Uh, it's very mixed. Uh, Rochester as itself is a majority African-American city, although the population and surrounding region are not. Uh, here we are back in Rochester. So some of the features that, that are uh, notable in Rochester are a lot of these big businesses, especially imaging. And the ALK education actually also comes from the Rochester Institute of Technology. So I would say uh, outside of imaging at the turn of the century, education is what Rochester is known for. And it's New York's second largest economy. Kodak, when it used to be an actual business that got you cameras in your hands and, uh, and film developed, uh, is headquartered there. And a lot of the work that was done in early photography years was pioneered there. Also Xerox. Uh, so every time you do a photocopy, there's a, a patent in a Xerox tower, and then, uh, a lot of the innovation happened and developed in that city. And it also has um, natural resources. So it's, it's on, on one of the Great Lakes, and it has a large waterfall and a large water source that went through the city, uh, and in the times before electricity, 
they were using that water for power, to power the uh, industry. So industry was built along the riverfront. And uh, like a lot of mid-sized American cities, we have uh, these large road systems that came in uh, in the 50s and 60s uh, to, to power our, our car industry. And what it did was, just like uh, you see here, it created these large moats around the city. So you can see a dense urban city center, and then outside of it, these suburbs and lots and lots of sprawl. So people moved from the city centers out, and it, it, uh, it tends to sprawl endlessly. It's a problem in the States. And I found, when I was there, I was a poor artist. Not that I'm still not a poor artist, but uh, I was a poor artist uh, in graduate school. And I decided uh, I couldn't both have an apartment and a studio. I had to choose one. So I went looking for a place in the city, having no experience doing this before, to find a studio to live in and to do my work in, or if I could find both. And I found buildings like these along the Industrial Railway. And in this building called the Hungerford Building, uh, it was largely uh, unoccupied, and it needed a lot of renovation, and it was illegal to live in, I thought, perfect. So it was just me, maybe a couple drug dealers, probably some, some uh, 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 homeless veterans were in there, a few artists, uh, lots of them starving artists, a few other businesses that would, would set up there because they, they wouldn't have environmental inspectors come in so they can do all their chemical industry in the building. And when I, when I got there, I found this place, the RRCDC which is the Rochester Regional Community Design Center or the Community Design Center Rochester. In this beautiful old building, once again, if you can only imagine, it, it was a, an industrial building at some point, became unoccupied, and it had this beautiful infrastructure and no, no, nobody in it. There's lots of buildings like that in Rochester and a lot of cities. Um, and I found my studio similar to this. So what I can do, and you don't see the whole view of it, I could live in it during the day, and I had a kitchen where you can't see in the, the photograph, um, and create, create the works I needed to create. And then at night, I would turn it into a studio space. So once a month, we can invite the public into the space and to see the kind of works I was making. And I started thinking of the space itself. How can I very cheaply, without much money at all, how can I turn this living studio space with all its environmental problems into a functioning gallery without spending money at all. And the kind of art I was making at the time, um, I was looking for inexpensive materials. So I would find old television sets and repurpose them, things that people weren't using anymore. Um, uh, just raw canvas, these are actually coffee grounds on canvas. Uh, but I also started to think about the space and how I use that space uh, during the days and during the nights and how I could use it to make art, and also how it fit within the context of the building itself. So now here I was in this building, I successfully found a white square to work, work in. I was making works that were hybrid works, partial performance, uh, partial painting, uh, lots of imaging, um, and uh, there was a space that people approached, this building. We had to get them to this part of town that folks usually didn't come to in those days. So I began thinking about it in these terms. I don't have many of these, but this is a Gordon Matta Clark image um, of the kind of work he was doing in the 60s and 70s in New York. Uh, and I, I think it's a, I've been thinking about it more recently. He would take structures and create sculptural spaces in the structures and uh, cut them with a, with a chainsaw or with other kinds of uh, materials and then the, the house or the architecture itself became a sculpture in, this, in, the, in the landscape. Um, and you, you could you know, view, now I know them all as just photographs. And without making the initial connection, when I first moved to Kosovo, I saw a lot of structures like this. You know, which to, to those of us who come from the States to move here, it's very uh, alarming when you see it. How could all these buildings be unfinished? Uh, when Gordon, Gordon, Gordon uh, Matta Clark was doing it, 
You know, he was doing it to expose unfinished places, to expose interiors, to expose the inside space and the outside space. And here it was happening all the time. And, you know, now I know very well why it happens. But um, now I see another kind of opportunity in unfinished spaces or unfinished buildings that could be an asset to Pristina in a different way. But I'm just formulating that now. So next year I'll talk on it. Um, so here we are, and I, here we are back in the CDC. Uh, and inside I found people doing this. And I didn't know anything about architecture or planning. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about photography. And uh, I, I was fascinated by, well, there's, there's other folks in this abandoned building, and they're all architects or urban planners. And they had uh, resumes that were fantastic. Uh, the director of it was a, a Yale graduate. Uh, the, the, uh, the other, the president of the board was similarly credentialed. And, um, and I thought, well, what, what do you do for the city? And I started thinking about the spaces. Now this is what they did. They worked with citizens and provided professional services for poor areas of the city. And this city had a lot of poor people. Uh, the, the suburbs weren't poor, but the, the spaces that needed help internally were. And uh, they needed help turning their ideas or the problems in their neighborhoods into solutions. And this space attracted young scholars and university presidents. This guy was the president of the University of Rochester, which is the biggest employer. There's 50,000, similar to UP, there's 50,000 undergrad students there, lots of graduate schools. And they would create these drawings, uh, speaking with uh, residents of neighborhoods and literally take the, the work out uh, to do charrettes in the neighborhoods themselves and explain to the residents and get input from the residents. So the idea would be to get a resident's hand on the page, not just talk, uh, not just uh, exchanging ideas, but to actually say, take this pen and mark here on the map and we'll show you what we're looking at. Tell me what your ideas are or what your problems are. And we would, in turn, take those and uh, turn them into a vision plan document. There's a lot of these. And then the neighborhood group could lobby the city, or they'd have a, a document uh, that was worked on by the professional group for very little money, so there's a lot of volunteering. And if you're a professional, a lot of crying about how come there's no money, and there's, this isn't uh, something you get into if you want to make money. Uh, but we would produce these, and sometimes these would then get put into action. And the neighbors and the, the community themselves would help in the construction. So it was a, a community building opportunity. And this would happen across the city. So uh, neighbors that hadn't met before uh, would meet, and they would meet to change the public realm, or they would meet to change uh, their neighborhood and their space. One of them that started this whole process to create a design center was a place called Art Walk. Now I want, I want you to, in the back of your mind to think of Christina at the moment as we go through this process and I show you what it came from. Um, Art Walk, there's our city center and you can see that, that large highway system. And this is University Avenue. It's one of the, the gateways to the, the inner city. And if, it, if you continue going out this University Avenue, you hit the highway again. And what they wanted to do, the city decided, because the buildings uh, and the, the use in this place had also fallen, uh, fallen out of disuse, these beautiful buildings, and they were just boarded up, uh, they were gonna uh, create a, a divided highway lane into the city uh, and destroy the character of the neighborhood. Um, you can see this sort of over time. We'll get to more of this. So what the, neighborhood, the neighbors did, and that includes the founder of the design center, got together and said, we don't want this uh, process happening in our neighborhood, so we need a response for the city. Uh, and they got together and planned, and they put together teams to take a look at what could happen in the area. Anybody could join, you didn't have to be a professional, you just had to be a resident of the area. And they came up with, uh, with plans based on these principles of design which, which they came up with as they were developing what a design center should do. And then they had a charrette and the public came out to speak about it. And also the mayor, uh, a long-serving mayor of, and a, 
a colleague from RIT, um, uh, Bill Johnson, came out and decided he would support this process. So they averted a plan to, to divide, uh, for another divided highway to feed in the city, and they turned it into this. Uh, and of course they, walked on, they worked on the principles of design um, that we think about wherever we live in the world, so crossways, pedestrian uh, ways, uh, green space, uh, parking, which is a huge issue, um, you know, to fit, the, uh, to fit the style of the city, and uh, began implementing it. And also at the same time they did contests. So, uh, you know, the, the, one of the innovations I've seen in Pristina in the last year has been uh, these, these poles that stop you from par parking on the sidewalk. And if you're a pedestrian, you love them. If, uh, but you, you get tired of looking at them at some point, and you say these are kind of ugly little, little poles sticking up out of the ground everywhere. Um, but one thing that could be done, as an example, is to do, uh, to enact the artist through the creativity in the community and uh, do design contests for it. And that's what they did with the benches in the area. Um, and they began implementing, uh, you know, putting more of the community into action um, and implementing some of these changes as well. Landscaping. Um, for me, I very much appreciate, when I, when I navigate Pristina, I very much appreciate small details. And community comes out again. And then a festival is done, uh, and the festival brought lots of folks uh, out to celebrate uh, what had happened or changed in that neighborhood. In addition, public sculptures became important, so that was planned uh, within the space along with the, with the green space. And little details like this that gave character um, to the entire, uh, the entire art walk area, which is a small area. It was really a block and a half, two blocks. It wasn't large. Uh, and here are some of the benches that you could see that were designed and are still there um, in Rochester. Bus shelters, uh, and so these are also uh, design students, architecture students, art students, citizens, residents getting together to develop designs and uh, using the capital of the schools and the faculties that are around um, to do judging of the materials. Uh, select designs and build them. Facades became very important. This is an old firehouse, which is a, a beautiful space that was now occupied by a, a writing community, writers and books, um, and, and the facades were worked on, giving character to the place. More public sculpture, gateways into green spaces, even if they're small green, green spaces. Uh, and community coming out between, uh, between different neighborhoods to, to come work on it. That was the first phase of it. It became so uh, popular, that method that phase two started, and it really activated the entire city and community. And this is the result of that. This used to be a fenced in area with nothing. This is next to the art gallery. And that became uh, a, large, a large sculpture garden. The fences came down, uh, as you can see here. This used to just extend on. There's other features that make it pleasant to, to, uh, to walk on. And we can go into all the details of this, but for time, I'm gonna move on. So here we are in Pristina. Here we are from above. Uh, this is a talk, or pieces of a talk, that I had done in New York after it being involved in uh, an art action here uh, shortly after I moved here. So I was looking at the same thing. What are the iconic landmarks? What, what makes the space a space? Uh, without, anybody, without asking anybody, just out there looking around and looking at the city. And we found this space. And some artists invited, invited me to participate in this event, as if anybody remembers this event. So they took a, an abandoned section of Bora Ramis, and, um, and I'll show you what they did to it. It had burned in a fire, I think, shortly after the war, nothing related to the war, um, and, uh, and became a, a disused place in Bora Ramis, and then it was a parking lot. 
for a while. I, I don't know what it is. It, it's still a parking lot. At least it's getting used for some other things at the moment. And I came in and I did a project uh, similar to what I did in my studios. Uh, so here I was in Pristina and I found a space. Okay, here's some willing people. Here's a space that I'm used to working on. And I, I began participating with the folks there. Uh, this is what the place looked like before the event. And there's a lot of names uh, that I would like to mention, but I, just for brevity, I won't at the moment. Uh, they're in town still working, many of them, for further on in their careers. And these young people went out to clean it uh, after getting the appropriate permissions and putting together a concept and working on what they were going to do with the space, a one-hour performance. And they slowly transformed it and repurposed the stuff. So what used to be the basketball arena, uh, or whatever was there at the time, uh, you know, the wood that was used for the seating got repurposed. Anything they found that they could reuse was repurposed. And then uh, the space slowly became cleaned and ready to use. In addition, some elements from the outside came in and I, it seems I always tend to do this now. Any project we're involved in, we try to bring the outside in, or if you're outside, you, you know, bring the inside out in some way. Um, so we brought some green space in there uh, to think about it, let the artists work. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of young folks to, to, uh, to coordinate. It went swimmingly well, it went very well. The space developed more and more, and the event was announced for those who didn't remember. And that night, um, there was a lot of things happening. I think Rita Ora was, was, was shooting her video <laughs> you know, that night on, on Newborn. Um, but also, I think uh, it, it drew a maximum capacity crowd. There was not, not, not everybody who wanted to see the event could do it in an hour. There were over 2,000 people who showed up. Um, and, and this is what it looked like as it was happening. So uh, there's my performance there. Each of these spaces had performances happening in them. Uh, and there was, there was music. Uh, some of you know a lot of these folks. And this is what it looked like inside. So people were really curious about this. What happened to this old space? Who are these people? What is performance art? Um, what can happen in an in a, a iconic landmark that's been there uh, the entire time? Just going to go through these quickly. This was a beautiful piece. Again, for brevity. So now we're back to the community design Pristina. Um, so having worked with several artists and traveling regionally, what can we do now for Pristina with, from our small corner up there near Gurmia and Alk? How can we work within the community? Um, so we started thinking about, okay, we'll do a symposium. The symposium part, this part, the part that I'm doing, for me is the least interesting part. It's okay, we transfer some ideas. But getting out there into the community and actually making a change for those who might never come to something like this, that's exciting. So we have to think about now, what are the design principles or urban design principles that we can come up with for Pristina um, that we can use to talk to the public those people who are non-professionals, residents of places, uh, that, that my neighbors, uh, what can we do? As part of our process, we just decided to do a mini charrette exercise in the Dodona neighborhood. Dodona, because um, it, it bridges where I'm living in the Sofalia area and Sheshi, you know, in town. And from Tokboshi to Sheshi, you have this very interesting space it's hard to navigate as a pedestrian. It's hard to navigate in a vehicle. It has lots of history. There's religious centers in different places of it. It has Park Wichitati, you know, there in the, the city center. Um, and if you're a visitor to Pristina, you don't know that there's a green space. You have to be a resident to know there's a green space uh, there and travel there. You can go to Gurmia, but there's no way to travel successfully from the end of Sheshi all the way up through Dodona to Tokboshe to get to Grimia. And I know there's a lot of plans that have been thought about, so we thought that's a great neighborhood to take a walk through on. And that's what we did, we had fun. We brought maps, 
We had some experts in from the states, the director, uh, uh, the president of the board of the CDC Rochester, and uh, our friends who put together the work, and we had a good time. I don't know if you know this guy. But um, as we went, residents came out, and they said, what are you doing? I see you making photographs. I see you have uh, maps out. And they said, well, we're, we're looking at the neighborhood to see how we can beautify it and see how we can improve it. Great. Let me get you some juice. Great. Come on out. And we, we looked together and we started looking at maps together. And at this stage, we're here with some suggestions. You just like I said, pen to the page of what we're working on and thinking about. And at the same time, and I'm gonna leave that there with, again for brevity uh, to, uh, before we get into uh, what we're gonna do with the final report. But the idea with the final report is to as immediately as possible put something into action with residents involved. Um, and what we started to work on was someone in the neighborhood decided in the Talpoche area that there, uh, I don't know if you know this, everyone just calls it uh, Prince Cafe in Talpoche. If you go there, I don't know if it's actually Prince Cafe, that's where everyone knows it. Um, has a, a, a small playground. Um, let me just go to the next one, maybe we can see it better. A small playground, and the, the, like many of the playgrounds for children, uh, they're in disrepair. So what we want to do is repair it, and we want to make and think about the larger space around the playground and how we can do it. So we're going to try, as a CDP, um, to raise some funds through crowdfunding. Uh, we already have some designs worked out, and see if we can transform a space together with the citizens and residents of the area and put into action, um, by the time we're done, uh, an improved park for children. I don't think everyone has to support that. If you don't, you're inhuman. You know? uh, and uh, a beautified space. And also with the principles in mind of education, educating the public or educating the residents uh, about what else can happen. So instead of thinking huge, we don't want to solve Kosovo, we don't want to solve uh, all the municipalities of Kosovo, we don't uh, purport to solve Pristina, we're not even going to solve Dodona. We're going to take one small project at a time and see if we can do it with a community design model and work with professionals, many of you in this room, uh, work with the municipality, regardless of government, it's not a political entity, a community design center, uh, to try to improve the environment. I'm out of time. Thanks. Very interesting seeing it from the American perspective, then down to our perspective. Uh, is there any question from the? Okay, I, I, I'll ask a question. Uh, for you personally, how was it working in a huge, like in a very regulated context, and coming here to the, to our mess? Uh, I, I worked in inner city Rochester where it's a, it's a very impoverished place. Uh, and poverty exists in America and in a very, I know, I know Kosovo is the poorest country in Europe, blah, blah, blah. But poverty in the States is, is very hard on, on the people. So in many ways, it's a lot easier to work here because people are cool. <laughs> you just, it's easier, it's more relaxed to work in, in Pristina. The, the built environment is much worse. In, in many ways, but but there's more people interacting with that much worse environment, so it makes it more pleasant in some ways. So I, it's it's not a scale of, of uh, oh so regulated and working so well and not. In the end, it's always about people. So uh, inner city Rochester has a lot of a lot of issues, gang issues. I think there's um I don't know the murder rate in Pristina, but in but in, in Rochester, you know, it'd be a good year if only 50 people were murdered, you know? Yeah. So uh, there's, you know, there's some things to celebrate about this, you know? 
okay, you know, there's some things we can think about. And another thing was, uh, how was, how much was the community ready to participate and to help? Like, here? was it here? Just, yeah. Um, I, we, there's community groups already. Like, all of this stuff already happens in many levels. So there's, the municipality has community groups and individuals and neighborhoods. I think there's 13 or 14 of them. Um, I, I, I didn't encounter any resistance. I mean, we'll see. When we start to actually implement something, we'll see. But I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's any resistance. It doesn't cost anything. It, you can get something improved and it's not going to cost anything. Well, you know, everyone could put in two euros here or we can find ways to, to raise funds. That's definitely going to have to happen. It can't always be, um, you know, the embassy paying for it or something. It, it's better to have shared funding because everyone has ownership. And it's easy. Um, okay. Hi, thank you for the presentation, it was great. Um, I just have a question for you. Yeah. Is that, you know, having lived here, I guess, for five years, what do you think Rochester could learn from Pristina? Um, I, yeah, Rochester, I think, could learn, it, it's more of a cultural exchange. We're trying to pair the cities as sister cities. So, um, y y when my family first came here, that's my daughter, and she was born here, so I have another stake in the game. My child, too, is growing up in Pristina. I'm going to make it a better place if I can. <laughs> um, when my family first came here, they said, you know, I said, oh, be, be ready. You know, there's potholes in the streets. It's not like you would imagine it. And they got here and they sat and had coffee on Sheshi and said, this is a virtual wonderland. We love it. What are you talking about? Okay, there's no Macy's or there's no big, you know, uh, the shopping isn't as good but who cares, people are interacting better. So a lot of the things that, uh, it's, it's a, um, keeping that, that attitude, that sort of togetherness, despite all the complaining, the talking, that's, a, that's something that can be learned. I don't know if you meant that or the built environment part, but okay. <laughs> that's one thing I think uh, Rochester could learn, uh, you know, in that context. Rochester is a bit of a cold place, both, both in the weather, it's very cold a lot, a lot of the year, and sometimes the people, that's the you know, Americans are very private, so these mid-sized cities can really um, learn from how to interact. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I actually have a question about that park, Park of Princes. Mm -hmm. It's actually called, I guess. Mm -hmm. I just live down there at the block, and it's a very good example. It's very dangerous for kids. Uh, but my question is actually, how come did you choose that spot? The, I mean, what kind of criteria did you apply to yeah. choose that, and not other places? I mean, there are also other places which are dangerous for children. Now. I don't know. Yeah, that, that one's pretty easy. There's two places where we're actually making a bid to change. One is the city park, some re re uh, renovations right in that city park area, which actually the, the city built some things on, but sometimes the things that come in are, are broken within a year and dangerous for children. I live near there. That's actually our neighborhood. That's Alk's neighborhood. So it's we go and have coffees there. So I, I, my daughter is on that playground. My neighbor, it wasn't my idea at first, it was my neighbor uh, who did it. And then uh, we mentioned it to the folks working on CDP uh, and uh, all from Pristina. Uh, and Volkan is here actually. Where, where are you? Raise your hand, there he is. He's working still on this project um, and thought it was a good idea, why not try this? We had a willing crowd. Um, we, we have lots of people that show up and we're going to do some advertising there. So come out and you'll start seeing ways to, to be get involved. And that, we'll start there. It's between Alk and the city center. And the future plans? Any other places? Um, well, there's, there's art production. Yeah, so that's, like, that's the other part of this that we're talking about, these broken structures and uh, you know, making these things. Future plans for, um, for CDP Let's, let's see if we can do one or two of these small projects and be here next year with a bigger crowd 
and with some some work to show what went well and what didn't go well it's a we'll see how the community uh, comes around that uh, you know that idea okay um, thank you very much